Hello, this is Coach Tim Campbell, and I'm your host for the Self Made is a Myth, Make a Difference Together show, where we're talking with successful business owners about the stories of their journey to building their business. And because we know that achieving success in business is not something that we do on our own, we are taking time to recognize the folks who have come alongside of us and helped us to excel. I'm excited to have a fellow business owner from Indiana with us today. My guest has traveled to five continents. In fact, in April of 2021, he was on three continents in one day. And we're going to ask him about that because that sounds pretty incredible. In his downtime, he enjoys writing, traveling, and mentoring young adults. And he is most proud of his family and the accomplishments in his business. It's my pleasure to welcome Ron to the show today. Hello, Ron. Good morning. Thank you. So, hey, let's start with having you um, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit of your personal story, like where you were born, where you live, about your family, and, and some of your hobbies. Sure, absolutely. I'm a Hoosier boy, born in Frankfurt, just up the road to Notch, and uh, went to Ball State. The apple bounced a couple times, didn't go too far from the tree, <laughs> and then uh, launched my career here in Indianapolis in the late 80s. Um, I'm married to the uh, smartest woman in the world, Cindy. Uh, 30 years this month, and have two boys, Tanner, who's 26, and married to a lovely young lady, Hannah. Uh, they've been married almost four years, and Hudson, who's 24, and engaged to another yo lovely young lady, Elaine, and they'll be in married in October. So that's a little bit about my personal background. Uh, I live in Westfield. I've lived in Indianapolis for a very long time, and uh, <clears throat> call this home. Wonderful. So tell us about the three continents in one day. Sure. So last year, I had the really cool opportunity to teach innovation skills, something I'm very passionate about, and to teach innovation skills to an organization called Wycliffe Ethiopia. You might recognize the Wycliffe name from the Bible translation world. And I've had a chance now in the last two, the two consecutive years to go to East Africa, Kenya, uh, this spring in, in Ethiopia last spring. Anyway, so Ethiopia is obviously in the continent of Africa. And in one day, we, we left Africa and flew to Asia and then bounced over to Europe and actually then back to Asia for uh, four days of a little R&R &R post retreat. So yeah, it's fun. And it's not actually that impressive once you do it because they're all pretty close together over there. <laughs> but it sounds cool. It sounds cool and it's still kind of impressive. <laughs> so Ron, what's a funny story that your family likes to tell about you that you'd be willing to share with us today? All right. No one believes me and I don't really care, but my son Tanner does. We were there. We saw it. So we have a motorhome and we're camping on one of the little peninsulas, Mission Point up in Michigan. And uh, after dinner, we're taking the trash out to the dumpster and we couldn't get a parking space. We're sitting in the parking lot, uh, just gonna hang out there for a little while. And it's dark and we take the trash out. And near the dumpster, we see these eyes and they're about six and a half, seven feet tall. I'm not making this up. There's no <laughs> tree around there. There's no tree nearby. It wasn't a deer. It wasn't a raccoon hanging from the air, <laughs> levitating. It was Bigfoot. It was Bigfoot, we're certain. We heard and saw Bigfoot because then we heard these massive steps running up the hillside, crunching trees and the crunching limbs and sticks and stuff. And we know it was Bigfoot. Interesting. So needless to say, <laughs> we ran, sprinted back to the RV. I'm, I'm driving while the slide outs are still coming in. I'm like, we're out of here. We're leaving. This, this place is crazy. <laughs> so you ask my son, we saw Bigfoot. Now my family, nobody believes me. Like, he didn't see Bigfoot. I'm like, okay. Then it was a then it was a seven foot black bear standing on its hind legs in Michigan. There you go, which is equally a good reason to pack up and get out of there. That's a big black bear. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So anyway, yeah, it's a good joke, but who knows what it was? It was yeah. just kind of crazy. Wow. <laughs> so Ron, tell us how the business came about, and at what point did you have the confidence that you could run your own business? So I started a technology for Bitwise Solutions back in 1991. <clears throat> and then um, for a couple of years, we we're building some pretty high end uh, engineering applications. Mm -hmm. And then along came this thing called the World Wide Web. Remember we used to call it that? Yes. <laughs> and uh, I was in San Jose at a conference and I kept hearing about the World Wide Web, World Wide Web. 
Like, what in the world is all this? So we got back and, and uh, did a little research. And in January of 1994, we signed our first contract to build a website with a company out of, uh, out of New England, Boston area. And uh, fast forward 27 years, uh, no, 25 years later, I sold that company four years ago. Um, and had a very successful organization, very successful teams. Uh, we did about 3,200 engagements over those 25 years for about 1,200 clients on five continents. We didn't do any work on the caps uh, or Australia. Anyway, um, our challenge was from the beginning of time it, in, the, in the web development business, our challenge was finding people. We could not find talent. And try as we might, we would interview relatively new grads coming out of college and think this is the ring or this is the one and just to be disappointed mm. and um, no skills, no capabilities, no, no soft skills, let alone the hard skills of technology. And so after a while, we just decided that we, we're, we've got to find another way. And so it was about 10 years ago. I decided if we're going to be successful in finding talent or growing talent, we've got to build our own. We've got to start our own university. And um, so I did. We're nine years old last week. So we're still celebrating our birthday for a while. Um, and so I started a university, a private university that's based in mastery of skills. And, uh, you know, necessity begets innovation. And um, here we are nine years later rocking and rolling and, and uh, just have a new home for Apprentice University, just moved, new campus yeah. and excited. So that's how, that's how I got to where I am today in a it's minute nice. and a half. Yeah. Well, Ron, tell us a little bit more about uh, the university and, um, you know, what do you guys do? How do you, you help folks and, and how would folks you know, learn more about it if it's something that they're interested in? in being Absolutely. Involved? Absolutely. Well, first, let me say that, <clears throat> This isn't to disparage anybody who's decided to send their, uh, their, their young adult to a, what we call a legacy university. Um, they are legacy models. They've been around a way long time uh, and ripe for disruption. <clears throat> and we're working on that. Um, but we believe, we're, we're adamant that in today's world, we're dealing in a VUCA situation. If you're familiar with the term VUCA, came out of the military a few years ago, and it describes the scenario, a situation. And VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That kind of sounds like the United States 2017 to today, yeah. right? Very, just nothing is like it used to be. Right. And so we believe that in order for a young adult to navigate a career and understand options and opportunities and so forth, uh, they have to be prepared to live in this VUCA world. Mm -hmm. it, you can't opt out of VUCA. It's, at, it's coming at you, yeah. <laughs> AKA 10% inflation, okay? Right. <laughs> it is coming at you without your option to exit. So we think that preparing young adults to think like a fighter pilot, flying through the Star Wars Canyon, if you remember that, at Mach 2, with fully capable, fully, fully loaded with skills to navigate and, and be successful exiting that canyon is what our job is. Mm -hmm. Notice I didn't say, we'll give you a degree in marketing. No one who hires anyone in marketing gives a flip about your degree in marketing. Nobody <laughs> cares. <Right. laughs> okay? Nobody hiring programmers cares about your programming degree. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It does not matter. So we're preparing through good old fashioned apprenticeships, the way everybody used to learn until about 1950. Uh, we're preparing young adults through an apprenticeship model, meaning you study, you work alongside a master of a particular topic, you glean and gain the knowledge and skills they have. They're mentoring you, they're pouring into you, and you're getting those skills over time. So ours is a three-year program. The first year is really about gathering those necessary skills to be that fighter pilot in the VUCA world. It's not about sitting in class, getting tests and grades and lectures. We don't have tenured professors. We believe that 
that ship sailed, sunk, and is rusting at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> uh, it just has. And, and uh, so our students over the three-year period, uh, they earn more than the cost of their tuition. There's no debt. Mm-hmm. And we're not, we're not to beholden to the federal government or any governments in our model. We don't ask for the student loan truck to back up money every month or so. That's not how we roll. So very budget friendly, yet all about skills. Hmm. So we're preparing students for those types of careers like marketing, like technology careers, cybersecurity, project management, and professional sales and IT administration, all the roles that no one can fill these days. Hmm. There's always openings. You know, when I speak in public, I ask people, <clears throat> raise your hand if you have enough people on your staff. <laughs> no one raises their hand. <laughs> and then I ask, raise your hand if you have a strategy to solve that problem. And no one raises their hand. And so we think, like starfish, we can't solve them all or save them all, but we can save a few. Yeah. And we can work with those students and those corporate partners, as we call them, to solve their staffing and needs and talent needs. It gives students tangible, marketable skills to launch into their careers. That's what we're doing. We do it from our campus on the west side. We're at uh, uh, 71st and 465 area on the west side, just inside the loop across from Eagle Creek. Mm -hmm. We have a 9,500 square foot new to us campus. It's a building that's been around a little while, but it's new to us. And uh, it's a beautiful place and it's a vibrant, bright uh, environment to gain real practical skills as a young adult. Fantastic. And you said earlier, you, you're celebrating your nine year anniversary. We are, we're nine years old now. When we first started out, we were like any startup, you're, you're the first iterations. We teach design thinking and innovation, by the way, the first few iterations were really rough and ragged. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> We still made a difference in many young adults' lives, but not like today, not the, this is high octane. This is jet fuel octane mindset. Um, And so, yeah, we're we're on the West side and uh, been doing this now nine years. We've actually managed and organized, I think the counter is up to about 210 or so apprenticeships now in nine years. Wow. So that that means young Tim is going on his apprenticeship and that's going to last about six months. By the way, we do a lot of podcasting related work at Apprentice University. That apprenticeship is going to last about six months at a time. So we've done 210 of those or so over the last nine years. Wow. That's so we know a thing or two about apprenticeship based learning. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, in, in, in our classes, if I could just add this. Yeah, please. Our classes are radically different than what you and I might remember from a typical college class. <clears throat> As I mentioned, one, we don't have tenured professors. We have, in, we have facilitators, mm-hmm. practicing professionals who are teaching our class. They're coming in, they get paid, not a ton, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's per class hour, it's competitive with other organizations. So our professionals come in and they're facilitating the conversation in those classes. So a mm-hmm. Socratic model, so you prep, read, answer questions, read books, uh, watch videos, whatever the case is, before class. And then when you come in, the, the instructor, the facilitator is just there to ask those probing questions yeah. to get you to engage. There are no tests. When was the last time you took a test, Tim, besides COVID? <laughs> right. We don't do it. Right. There are no tests. We don't memorize things. We have this thing called a smartphone that... Yeah. It enables us to get to whatever answer we need, PDQ. Uh, and we don't do grades. We don't think grades are, you know, grades are a great academic exercise from a legacy a long time ago that is no longer germane or relevant. Right. Wow. Can you tell we're a little Very cash cool. About Very you? cool. Yes. So um, you, you mentioned um, design thinking and, and innovation earlier. So I can definitely, I've got background in that from, from oh, remarketing cool. days. So can definitely see how everything you just talked through is you, you know, bit by bit, you looked at how, what's a better and different and, and uh, you, you, unique way to do this that makes the experience and the outcome significantly better than the old version. Yeah. You know, don't, don't tell our students, don't share this, right? <laughs> but 
we fervently believe every student is an exercise in design thinking. Mm. Think about it a minute. A student walks in and says, I want to be a programmer or I want to be in marketing. And we've had this happen. Had a really bright young lady a number of years ago. I want to be in marketing. Came in, had her first apprenticeship in marketing. About 75 days into it, 45 days came to us and said, I hate marketing. This is horrible. <laughs> but, you know, that's what all her peers were saying. Yeah. going to be in marketing. Um, <clears throat> so we believe that then her next iteration led her to project management roles and led her to engagements that were far beyond the capabilities of a typical 20 year old. Yeah. The typical, I mean, our students are leading and running initiatives, leading and running departments within organizations, um, acting as the CEO of spin outs of some of our companies. Uh, so these are, these are very highly skilled students who've said, yeah, I could go sit in class and get grades and take tests and memorize stuff. And, you know, remember we used to joke about, yeah, I took the test, but that was an hour ago. I don't remember what it was. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's not funny. That's not funny. My alma mater, my alma mater, Ball State, charges for your freshman year $27, $26,825 to go there and live on campus for a year and take classes. $27,000 to memorize stuff. Yeah. When I was there, we had to memorize the periodic chart and it was on the wall. It was on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a physics class and we had to memorize the periodic chart. And it was on the wall. And the test was turn your desk around and recreate the periodic chart. And went, it's right there. <laughs> right. It's right there. I didn't understand it when I was 20. And I sure don't get it when I'm 57. <laughs> I've often thought about writing to Ball State saying, I want my money back for that class. Yeah, right. <laughs> There's got to be a, a statute of limitations that doesn't run out on warranties. <laughs> so, Ron, share a story where someone pushed you or inspired you that you could do it when maybe you thought you couldn't and what the impact that person had on you. Wow, that is a great question. Uh, well, starting Apprentice University was that. And that's who starts a university at 50 years old. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's an audacious activity. We're not a coding academy. We're much broader than just a narrow focused set of skills. Um, but nobody told me I couldn't. Uh, some folks at Indiana University said I couldn't, but that's <laughs> another conversation for another day. Um, the inspiration really came from. My family, my wife, Cindy, uh, we've both tag teamed several different educational endeavors over the years. Uh, it, but I had some, you know, I had some practice. Maybe this is a, a different lens on that question. Uh, way back when Mitch Daniels in his first term took office, I got a call from one of his lieutenants a couple months into his, his uh, uh, term in they said, hey, Ron, we want to start Indiana's first statewide virtual charter school. Hmm. And we want you to do this. I'm like, first, OK, that's not going to be easy. Statewide, <laughs> that's big. <laughs> virtual, OK, I get technology. I own a technology company. And charter school, what in the world does all that mean? Yeah. So I literally had to go to school to get it to understand all the moving parts. Uh, three years later, we launched what was then what then became Hoosier Academies. And we were serving, I think, at the peak, just under 4,000 students. Hmm. Uh, so the encouragement came from our former governor yes. when he called me to ask, so are you in? Well, what knucklehead's going to tell Mitch Daniels no? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> sure, Gov, uh, got it. Yeah. Um, but boy, did I learn a lot. I learned so much. And I learned that I think most critically for that particular endeavor, and I was still running Bitwise at the time, by the way, this mm -hmm. was just a, this was a side thing that I take, that I took on. Yeah. This is before Apprentice University. But I learned, Tim, that, that education was, was so messed up. This is 15 years ago, 14 years ago. So messed up then in, in, in not repairable. I mean, irreparable state. Not even a fixer-upper. It's a burner-downer. It's not even a fixer-upper. 
and look forward to today, the chaos that we have going on in our schools, be from little kids, talk about Florida, right? From little bitty kids all the way up through college these days, it's really messed up. And don't forget to learn. Right. Don't forget to learn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or memorize. So that, that <laughs> virtual charter experience caused me to be a hyper-absorptive sponge about education. Yeah. And I took in knowledge. I had the opportunity to travel around the state, meet some really cool folks around Indiana, have a really good time doing it, learned a lot, uh, got into a really intriguing conversation with one parent because it's virtual charter school. Students learn from wherever they wanted to be learning. Sure. You could be in your motorhome in, in uh, Grand Canyon. You could be sitting at home at your living room. You could be wherever you wanted to be. And I came across the family and a mom is enraged at me. She's angry as can be. And I said, well, this is after my talk. Why are you, I said, why are you so upset with me? She said, well, <clears throat> it's the government's job to take care of my kid between eight and four. <laughs> and you're telling me to be in your school, I have to be part of that. And they're with me from eight to four. <laughs> and I just looked at her thinking, surely she's kidding. <laughs> no, <laughs> surely she's kidding. And I said, well, uh, no parent should relegate responsibility for their kid to a any government for any reason whatsoever, period. Yeah. Case closed, door welded shut. Ever, ever, ever. They're your kid. <laughs> yeah. Okay? And second of all, yeah, that's our model. And if it's not for you, then okay, good luck. But that's not how we work. Yeah. Hey, Ron, what's your biggest learning as a business owner? Biggest learning. Uh, well, my daily prayer as a business owner is God give me patience right now. Uh, and I think that's the biggest key is, is patience. Mm -hmm. Things always take longer than you think. Yeah. Hitting those goals always take longer than you think. Yeah. Uh, getting your stride, getting momentum always takes longer than you think. Uh, that's a big deal. And I think maybe more important than that, but certainly right on par, <clears throat> is hire people who are a whole lot smarter than you. Yeah. A whole lot smarter, not, not just a little. Uh, you should know as a business owner, when you walk into a meeting with your staff, you are the caboose when it comes to smarts. You should know straight up. I got a lot of room of really smart people, and my job is to make sure that they're happy doing what they're doing. Yeah, I love and that. I think that's a big key, is you hire some super smart people. I've been really blessed at really blessed at Apprentice to have an amazing team of Angie and Colleen and Anna and, and uh, Maggie, just a, a phenomenal staff that awesome. they get it, they get innovation. We use design thinking in all of our meetings. Uh, we practice what we preach. So it, you just got to have smart people. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, so some people can be intimidated by hiring people smarter than than them, and and then they just hold themselves back, right? But I love that perspective of, you know, let let people let people do what they're educated to do or experienced to do, and don't you know get out of their way and let them perform. Absolutely, absolutely. So Ron, we know as bi that business success doesn't happen in isolation. So what's a challenge that you had over the years and who, who's a, a, maybe a fellow business owner that came alongside of you and helped you get through that? Mm. Challenges. No, there's always, uh, not, not as much as it used to be perhaps, but there's always the challenge of, of, of drama in a business, right? And I like to say that the drama club for Apprentice University meets in Fargo, North Dakota on the fifth Tuesday of every January. <laughs> so go, have a good time, uh, knock yourself out. And when you're done with your drama club meeting, come on back, because we're not having it. Uh, you know, I, I, guess, uh, I, I guess just helping, ha having, having professionals around. Uh, my, my dear friend, Robert Scott, is an attorney here in town. And I've confided in Robert from everything A to Z. And uh, he's been with me. We've worked together now for 30 some years. Uh, one of my best friends. Um, my friend Scott Whitlock at Flexware uh, Innovation is uh, another great sounding board. In the middle of the night, you get a phone call from Scott. Hey, man, I need to talk. Okay, great. Let me 
grab some coffee and let's chat yeah. and vice versa. Guys that you can call another friend nearby here, Bruce Osborne, guys, you can call, it doesn't matter what time of day it is. And they're going to stop whatever they're doing and say, yeah, give me, you know, give me five minutes. I'll call you right back. And they're, and they're in the room. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if I have one specific person, uh, my business partner at Bitwise way back, Scott Workman and I were, um, you know, super confident together. Uh, just people that you can trust. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I hear a lot um, from folks that it can be lonely at the top, and and you know, it's people don't want to take that that stress and burden home with them, and so they just deal with it on their own. So I love your message that you've got a network of people that you can reach out to and and confide in and be able to talk through stuff because. The running a business is hard and right there's a lot of things that we we shouldn't be trying to figure out on our own and and need to have that outlet of of folks to talk to yeah you know i'm i'm very fortunate infinitely fortunate um so my my top lieutenant at apprentice university her name's angie merle and uh my wife cindy and angie and gary her husband were super close friends i mean vacation together, hang out together kind of thing. So I'm, I'm beyond blessed. I get to work with my best friend. It's really cool. And all the guys out there that are going, you're a guy and you have a woman who's your best friend. Yeah. Get over it. Get over it. (laughs) Right. Man up. Okay. Deal with it. Um, But anyway, I, I, I am blessed. I I get to, uh, Angie's a phenomenal sounding board. You know, like to the whole point of this, this interview, right. You can't do it alone. She's a phenomenal sounding board. Um, we don't always see eye to eye. Now, she quickly realizes I'm usually right, and then, and then things are better. <laughs> Sometimes it takes her longer than normal to get there, but you know, that's okay. She'll figure that out someday. She'll just shortcut and go, Yeah, Ron's right. I should remember that. But in all seriousness, uh, I'm really fortunate I get to work with somebody that smart, that that quick, that understanding. And I think more, I think equally important, um, that resilient in our relationship that we can not see eye to eye. We can, we can go at it and we do, we have, uh, but our mutual, our mutual respect and admiration for one another in our chief goal of what we're trying to accomplish trumps all that. Yeah. That's awesome. So Ron, as you think about the next three to five years, what are the biggest challenges that you see that you'll face in reaching your goals and who are the types of people that you'll need to resolve those? That is a phenomenal question. Thank you. Uh, Angie went on a podcast last month, a national syndicated podcast and leaked the story of Apprentice University, leaked the secret of what we've been doing here for the last several years. And all of a sudden, literally in the last 30 days, we've been fielding dozens and dozens and dozens of inquiries of students from around the country. Hmm. So our single largest situation right now is housing for students. We don't have dorms. I frankly don't want dorms. Um, That just spells trouble backwards and forwards. Um, (laughs) So right now it's housing for students. What are we gonna do with all these students that are inquiring and wanting to stay here? And then second, second our challenge is how do we stay ahead of the demand and how how might we find the right companies that understand our ecosystem and want to bolt onto that? Mm-hmm. And we're working really hard. We, if you heard our pitch about being a corporate partner, I'll give you the really quick skinny of that. We're working really hard to blur the lines between what your business does and what we do at Apprentice University. Mm-hmm. We want it to be completely and entirely integrated into a shared ecosystem. And we're getting there. We're actually making some really cool progress. Got a ways to go, but we're making some really cool progress. So what are we going to need to get there? Well, I need trustworthy families who might have that spare bedroom, a kid moved out or house bigger than they need or whatever the case may be. I need families willing to say, hey, you know what? Um, I'll put my hat in the ring. Uh, We want to do a background check, of course. Um, Make sure there's nothing weird there. Uh, so we need families willing to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm open to bringing a student or two in and giving them a safe place to live and helping them get started. Our, our, our society needs that. We, we don't have a model for an 18-year-old 
to be financially self-sustaining and living on their own right. uh, before they get the skills to be that VUCA, VUCA ready fighter pilot coming at us. Yeah. Uh, so we need those families that are really willing to step in and help us with housing with students. And then the second one is the corporate partners that, that get what we're doing and, and embrace what we're doing. Many of our corporate partners have completely sunset their internship programs. Mm. and said, we're not, it's a waste of our time. We spend so much time finding interns and they come in here and the work isn't meaningful for anybody. Right. And then they leave and we don't hear from them again. And we spend all that energy for nothing. And so our, many of our corporate partners have said, we're exclusively focused on engagement with apprentice, Apprentice University and their apprentices. That's awesome. Uh, Jim Rohn, one of my favorite authors, uh, his quote, we become the average of the five people we spend the most time with is uh, something that uh, I find inspiring. As you think about that, Ron, is that exciting? Is it nervous? Make you nervous? What, what's your thoughts from a business standpoint? I could not agree more. I, I wholeheartedly believe that quote. I've, I've thought about that often. Uh, I, I echo back to Angie uh, and my wife, Cindy, who's the smartest woman. You know, she married me, so she's got to be smart. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I have two boys that are super bright as well. So yeah, the, the idea, I, I get that math. I get the five smartest the people that you're with the most time. Uh, that you're the average of that group. But again, I think I, I pull down the average. So I'm, <laughs> I'm hopeful they all feel the same way. Uh, but truly, truly, that is the case. And I, um, I'm just blessed and fortunate to have smart people around me. Well, and it sounds like if I can stretch a little bit that your your university model is kind of based on that as well in terms of, you know, it's not just the professor teaching, but it's everybody learning from one another and, and doing their own research and yep. making sure that we're raising the, the bar for everyone. Absolutely. You know, we, we practice and fervently believe in cohort-based learning. So a cohort of a dozen students or so are given an assignment. This is the assignment. It's not a group project, but that, that's, that's a bunch of baloney most of the time. Um, <laughs> but you're given an assignment to accomplish something and you have to produce a work product mm. in our world, you have to demonstrate mastery of a skill in order to advance. It's not take a test and go, yeah, I did this. Yeah. You've got to show you, it's like Missouri, show me, show me your work. Yeah. So that cohort then becomes very, very interdependent and they're influenced by our staff, by our instructors, by our mentors and corporate partners and so on. Uh, and then they're learning. But I would tell you, if you came to Apprentice University and ask any one of our students that have been there for a little while, what's the number one phrase you hear at Apprentice University? It's figure it out. <laughs> Love it. That's real world. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Tim, Tim, where did you go to college to get your degree in creating podcasts and video casts? Where, where did you learn that? I, I did it. I figured it out. <laughs> you figured it out, right? That's everybody that gets that. Yeah. understands and business owners have to understand that yeah. but in the VUCA world in the Mach 2 VUCA world figuring it out is a it's a it's a required DNA yeah. character trait you got to have that yeah it, it's funny that you say that because I I coach my clients on when an employee comes with a question don't give them the answer ask them to come back with a solution Right? Yeah. Or a couple of solutions. And then if they've done their homework, right, and given it some thought, then you can engage with it. But don't don't let them cheat. Right. And yeah. come for yeah. the answer. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's Wholeheartedly crazy. agree. So um, last question here, Ron, if there was something catastrophic that happened in the business, who's the first person you'd call and what would that conversation be? Hmm. I think. Um, I'd probably call my mom. My mom is one of the most, uh, and my dad, but my mom is, is uh, one of the most, uh, I don't like the term, spiritually deep. I, that sounds so cheesy, but legitimately, authentically, spiritually deep women ever, ever. I mean, she would be a rock star in Bible times kind of woman. Yeah. Um, I would call her and say, I don't know what to do. Um, not 
building had a fire or something like yeah. that. I figure all that out, but I'm talking about something, but I would certainly seek my mom and my dad's counsel. Um, and then I would go to my, go to my key friends, some of which I've mentioned uh, for sure. Angie, for sure. My wife, Cindy, we will we'll definitely be talking about things like that. Mm-hmm. And I might even go outside of that group because we fervently believe that when you change how you see a problem, you change the problem you see. Yes. And if I'm in an echo chamber with 10 people that see me every day, chances are they see the problem the same way I do or pretty close. Yeah. Uh, so I might break out of that and go to somebody that knows me tangentially or whatever and say, what would you do? Give me some thoughts. Awesome. So you mentioned this already, but it sounds like you've been blessed with some in- incredible people in your life who have helped you on your, your business journey. So if they were all here on the show today, what would you want to say to them? Oh, thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for your patience. Uh, when, when the going uh, was tough, not gets tough, was tough, you were there. Uh, and when the going gets tough in the future, I'm sure they'll still be there. So thank you for the past and thank you in advance for the future uh, <laughs> when things aren't going as we imagined. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's the biggest key. And, and I, I think also just the the um, trust. You know, we talk about design thinking and this is a quick side note. We talk about design thinking and anybody that's looked at the, you know, the five circles in the design thinking cycle, blah, 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 blah. It always starts with empathy at the top. I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong because you aren't going to let me into your world to gain empathy about whatever circumstances or challenges you're facing without trust. Mm. Trust begets empathy. You're not going to come into my world and ask probing questions. I might give you the superficial answer, right? If you're not going to ask those meaningful, fruitful questions without trust. So to those people, I would say, thank you for trusting me in the past. Thank you for trusting me into the future. Awesome. Well, Ron, it has been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And for those who tuned in, thanks for listening to Self Made is a Myth show with your host, Coach Tim Campbell. Be sure to help spread this movement by liking the show and posting it on your social media. To join our movement, go to bemadtogether.com. Okay, folks, that's a wrap. Make sure to pay it forward, and I'll see you all next time. Take care. Thanks, Tim.